we're going to prepare somebody for self-defense. And we're, when I say self-defense, I don't mean, you know, in a bar, you know, guys get, you know, I mean a, a bad situation because someone's coming to do you real harm um, and such. If they just want to rob you, then you give them the money and then whatever, you know, uh, if they have a weapon or something. So on that, I just want to bring up a couple points that I think people are missing when they're talking about real self-defense. And the first one is that we should look at the worst case scenario. You know, when we do jujitsu, often some of the first things we learn is mount escape because that's a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're, when we transfer our jujitsu into an MMA realm environment, again, context changes. Now our hand position has to be a little, say we're doing guard bottom now. Hand position has to be a little different because if I just dig for an underhook, they're going to drop an elbow over the top. So we have to be checking the elbows and making sure we're in a position where we can't get hit with the elbow. When we transfer and go another step, we say, hey, self-defense, the most dangerous thing can happen is that somebody pulls out a pistol or a knife on you. So that's where we change hand positions again, and we change our focus to always assume that there's a weapon involved. And then not just know that that's the case, because a lot of people uh, I know that they'll train for self-defense. We're talking people that are training their law enforcement, maybe military, whatever it is. They, what they want is self-defense. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they say, okay, we're going to train. Uh, and I know a weapon could come out. Mm -hmm. But in, as, you, as we know, if we don't train it, it's in our sparring, in our rolling then we're not going to actually be ingraining the motions or ingraining the positions, ingraining the focus to always look for that motion. Oh, they're drawing something or they're going here, they're drawing. So that's because uh, I know you, you wanted to hear a little bit about the self-defense. I think that's the, the main thing that I've really uh, added to the self-defense, straight self-defense realm mm -hmm. is that anytime we're kickboxing, clinch your ground or scenario, that's the thing. Self-defense. There's also a scenario that you don't have. We don't have an MMA. Uh, is that as we're doing this, we are always monitoring the hands visually from kickboxing range. In the clinch, we should really try to use visual, but we want tactile. Also, we want to be grabbing. You know, that's why double biceps high. Man, that is so good for self-defense against somebody much bigger and stronger. A double bicep tie still works. They, they struggle to get their arm out of there and you duck to the back and uh, You're just controlling a really good thing. Space. Yeah. So uh, that, I just wanted to bring that up. Is, yeah, my whole emphasis on self-defense. Oh, I do have a BGJ for the Street program Ooh. that uh, I think people would find very interesting because it's all about what happens when there is weapons in yeah. the environment. What happens when someone's going to Okay, Vale Tudo, we had punching elbows, headbutts. Then we add weapons. The possibility, I mean, there's a, a likelihood that they're going to bite you, so you have to be aware of that. And, you know, a lot of different things. Sure. But it's just, it's really jujitsu based. Sure. But we'll you put, have uh, send me all those URLs, and we'll make sure we put them in, uh, at the bottom here in the notes so people can check that out. Okay. Um, yeah. We've had some products like that, too. Paul Sharp, in particular, is has put some stuff out. Um, he has a new video out. It's actually with uh, BJJ Fanatics. It's presumed right. for self-defense. Awesome. And it does come back exactly to what you're talking about, which is controlling the hands. One thing That's he it. talks about, and, and Paul and I have talked about this quite a bit, is, um, and we, one of the things we try and do at the gym is you're, you're right. I think uh, the vast majority of people that sign up don't sign up because they want to compete in a jiu-jitsu tournament or they want to fight MMA. They sign up for self-defense. So right. They'll take confidence, uh, get in shape. But deep down, I think really what they want to do is they want to be able to not be in a situation, be able to defend themselves in a situation like you described. Right. And the tools are there. All the tools to be able to defend yourself in those situations are there, as is the appropriate training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and in the clinch, as you know. Um, they're all going to come down to the same fundamental clinch positions that you'd see in Greco or Muay Thai. But what gets lost, I think, is the focus. And just reminding students, like when our students first come to the gym and, and go through the introduction classes, the intro classes for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, every class that the conversation of self-defense is brought up the context of self-defense is brought up. 
because what I don't want to have happen, you know, is I don't want to have, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. You'll have a blue belt or a purple belt who's got, he has some MMA training or she has some MMA training. She's talented on the ground. And because maybe they don't actually realize what they can do because they're constantly playing game versus game, jujitsu versus jujitsu or MMA versus mm -hmm. MMA, they're going up against other skilled fighters. They would think, Oh, I need to go take a, Krav Maga class to get some self-defense, you know, and, and in reality is you can take them and, and work the material I'm sure you're talking about or what, what we talk about with Paul or controlling the hands, controlling the inside space and, and they can pick it up like that and they can pick it up like that because he or she has five or six or seven years training in that delivery system and it just in, involves a, a, a little touch of dirt, you know. Whereas the flip side of that is somebody that gets so hung up on this is street and this is sport, they never really take the time to develop the solid skill in the delivery system. So they would not be capable of competing against another blue belt or purple belt because their whole focus is on the street. Right. And they may have the, the, the techniques, you know, but the actual skill set of the delivery system, the movement, the ability to, to put their body where they need it to be, against resisting opponents, that's gone, right? Because that comes yeah. only from the delivery system. Absolutely. So I, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, I actually became a Krav Maga instructor. Oh, okay. Uh, I, didn't, I actually didn't know that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine yeah. because, again, it's the truth. But the guy I did it under, this guy near my mom, uh, you know, he actually is a real deal. He, after 9-11, when uh, special forces from Canada and United States went to Israel, to get training, he's he was one of the guys training these guys, and also you know he's he's a real deal. But the great majority of Krav Maga, they never add resistance, right? Or if they do, they do some kickboxing rounds, and uh, that's the. There are some that I mean, Nir showed me a video of those guys in in Israel training, and they were just like we used to train. Like sure. there is, we're talking about head trauma and, right. and such. But uh, yeah, it's the same thing. They're like, oh, I know how to do this and this. And then they start doing the like gun disarms where you're going here and all this sort of thing. But the same thing, pressure testing. So what I did was I would learn all these different gun disarms from there and from other people as well. And then what do I do? I go to Egan mm. and we go, okay, we're going to train. I said, hey, let's first, before we train, let's do this here. You take the gun, you point it at me. I'm going to try to take it away from you. So I do it and no chance. Then I, uh, you know, a month later, I have another one I'm going to try. I've been practicing it, right? I go, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And then finally, there was one that worked. And I remember when I did it, I did this. And he starts laughing. He goes, man, do that again. I thought, oh, I'll see. I, boom, I did it again. And it actually worked again. And then there's some things off it. So there's some really practical ones. Sure. Um, but guess what? You have to have the feeling of dealing with the resisting person because when the first one, they move and they naturally take it out of position, you have to flow to the next one and such. Uh, one thing different in, in self-defense, especially knife and gun defense, is sometimes you turn your back, especially knife. Because if you're, if you're doing knife defense out there, one thing to think about we want to control the knife, of course. Well, first of all, just to be clear, we don't want to be there. We want to right. give them what they want. We want to be out of there. But if you have to do it, do it to protect someone, a loved one or whatever, you want to control the knife. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we go, okay, control the knife. That means we're going to control the knife arm. Okay, well, you have to control the knife arm in a certain way because if you do like the old outside two-on-one, they're going to switch hands. So it's not actually controlling the knife. So what we have to do is control the knife in a way to make it difficult for them to switch hands. So I have three videos of actual stabbings where the defender ends up grabbing a hold of the arm. The other person switches hands immediately. Not trained people, 